So what we're doing is, you know, this prospect theory paper basically attempts to outline a framework and give a menu of the different ways that people use, you know, mental heuristics, people perceive gains and losses, to come up with some sort of unified theory for decision making under risk. And what we see moving forward in papers and what we see, you know, what gets cited the most is that S-shaped value function. The people are like obsessed with that S-shaped value function. You see it all the time. You see these other parts of the paper, they don't show up as much, but they're still really helpful to think about because the authors really try to <coughs> lay out, well, what are all the things that we do that deviate from this expected utility model? And we don't want to forget about the ones that just you know, aren't as prevalent or aren't as obviously easy to understand coming up with a, you know, coming with a nice S-shaped graph, whatever. They, we at least want to give you know, proper respect to all these different things that this seminal paper talks about. So, what Kahneman and Tversky argue is that when people are asked to make decisions that involve risk and probabilities, that in order to make the choices easier to compare, that there are a number of heuristics that go on. And we've seen a few of them here with the rounding and stuff like that. But can we come up with a name? Can we put them into buckets? Can we think about some steps that likely happen in order to make choices easier to compare? And they came up with sort of six different categories. And they said, these are, these are six things that we can define, that we can understand, that we can see happening in practice, that we can give names to so that we know to look out for them. So we've got coding, combination, segregation, cancellation, simplification, and detection of dominance. So that's nice. We want to understand what all of these are. Some of them are pretty straightforward and things that we've already talked about. That coding just refers to specifically assigning an outcome to a gain or loss category. You know, deciding where that outcome fits on the horizontal axis of our value function. Because, for example, and it, it seems obvious, right? Because if we take a very simple example, I give you $5. You're like, well, obviously that counts as a gain of five. Like, come on, really? But it's not necessarily that simple because your coding depends on your reference point. You know, say I had been telling you for the last week that I was gonna give you $10 and then I give you $5. Is it as obvious as it was in the first case that that would be a gain of five? I would argue no. So we don't wanna take the, you know, we don't wanna take this step for granted because you're like, oh, that's the whole point of this <coughs> gains and losses relative to this reference point. It's not always obvious how to turn these objective outcomes into the gains and losses. But that's what the coding is, saying we need to figure that out, we need to you know, compare things to our reference point, we need to, in order to do that, define our reference point. Okay. Then we've got combination. So say combination is just combining probabilities associated with different outcomes or in this case, different in the sense that we're counting them as different, but in terms of a gain and loss sense, they're in fact identical. So if I was going to tell you, for example, now we're starting to use the notation of the paper, you'll notice in the paper that a prospect is represented by sort of a number of ordered pairs within a set of parentheses. So you would see potential outcome one, as an ordered pair, semicolon, potential outcome two, semicolon, and so on and so forth. So for example, if I had a prospect that looked like, I'm giving you $100 with probability 0.2, I'm giving you $100, but now I'm giving you $100 in quarters maybe, for some reason we're counting this different, that that's gonna happen with probability 0.1, and then I'm giving you zero, with probability 0.7. This is what a prospect 
could look like, and that's how you interpret that, that it's just a shorthand for what I was giving you in words before. What you'll notice in the paper is that if there's an outcome that's literally zero, they just don't include it. <coughs> I just put it here. I decided to make this zero and explicitly put it in just so you could see that the probabilities did actually add to one. Okay. But what combination is saying is like, well, this seems silly because if I have an outcome where you're giving me $100 in $1 bills, and that's happening with probability 0.2, I have another outcome, you're giving me $100 in quarters, probability 0.1. If my brain is, ca is coding both of those as a gain of 100, meaning that I don't really care whether I get quarters or dollar bills, I was trying to make both of those kind of inconvenient. If I'm actually perceiving that as the same, then the combination phase would suggest that rather than look at these separately, obviously, you would just turn this into getting 100 with probability 0.3 and then zero with 0.7. And like I said, we might even drop that and not even explicitly put it in at all. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward. We can think about a segregation component. Now, what this means is say I was to pose to you an offer that would be very much in your favor. I could say, I'm going to give you $100 with probability 0.2 and $200 with probability 0.8. And that's how I phrase that to you, right? And I could say, all right, as a prospect, I might code that 100 with probability 0.2 is a gain of 100, and then 200 with probability 0.8, code that as a gain of 200. It seems like the obvious thing to do. Segregation suggests that this is not psychologically how we perceive this. That psychologically, and you know, these, these editing heuristics that we're doing, our brains in some way seem to think, oh, I'm getting $100. And hey, maybe I'm getting another $100. So this segregation, the editing step is saying, well, when you have something where you're definitely for sure either gaining or losing, we tend to segregate that out and say, all right, let's put that for sure thing in one bucket and put the uncertain thing in another bucket. Then we'd say, all right, well, we're getting $100 for sure. And then our prospect would, sim would simplify to, okay, then we're getting another zero with probability 0.2 and we're getting another 100 with probability 0.8. And again, in terms of our notation, you'll sometimes see this where the zero outcome just isn't explicitly put in there. So that's just the segregation phase is referring to. Again, you know, computationally pretty simple, and you can start thinking about when we're talking about all of these different editing steps that these, author that these authors seem to think is happening in the world, you can ask yourself, hey, do I do that? Do I not do that? Like I said, you're not necessarily representative. I don't want to I don't want you to take yourselves as representative, but it's still fun to think about like, does this seem intuitively reasonable to me? So so far, the editing phases that we've talked about are these editing steps that we've discussed are talking about like one prospect. Right? That we had one thing in parentheses. And we say, you know, that thing in parentheses is the equivalent of I'm giving you $4,000 with probability 0.8 and 0 with probability 0.2. You're like, okay, that's a set of outcomes. Only one of those is actually going to transpire. And the editing steps that we've looked at so far just have to do with what we would do with one prospect at a time. The cancellation step then talks about what we do when we're presented with a choice. You know, a choice between two prospects, a choice among three or more prospects, whatever. And the cancellation phase is just a, you know, more technical way of saying what we said before, though, when people are making decisions, they tend to ignore the commonalities between the decisions and focus on the differences. 
And so remember the original question that you were given, where you were given either $1,000 or $2,000 up front, most of you likely weren't thinking about that $1,000 or $2,000 up front. You said, well, because I get that no matter which of these choices I make. That's basically what we're talking about here, but at a slightly more nuanced level. You know, say I was to give you something where, you know, one option was you got $100 with probability 0.2, you got $50 with probability 0.5, and you got $25 with probability 0.3. And now I'm asking you to make a choice between that risky outcome and one that has, again, 100 with probability 0.2. Maybe now we have 40 with probability 0.4 and 30 with probability 0.4. The cancellation editing step is like, well, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand what's going on here. I noticed that both of these prospects have a 20% chance of me getting $100. All right, let me ignore that. Let's just focus on, you know, let's focus on this thing over here. Because I, I have this potential outcome in both of them. Let's just discard that. Let's not look at that. And let's focus specifically on the differences to try to make this computationally more simple for us. But that's what cancellation talks about. Simplification is pretty, you know, it's pretty much what you would guess given what we're talking about here. That this is just talking about either rounding the probabilities or rounding the outcomes themselves. Because if you think about it, if I was to give you something, you know, you get a hundred dollars with probability point four nine 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 nine, and you get Two hundred dollars and one cent with probability of 0.2, and then you get zero with the, you know, one minus the sum of these probabilities. Are you likely to literally think about it in this way? Probably not, right? That we're saying, well, if I'm going to make any sense of this, if my brain is going to be able to do any sort of, you know, expected value, expected <coughs> utility calculation, my brain's not going to be doing. And here I even made it easy, right? Because multiplying 100 by this isn't so bad. If it was like, you know, you get a gain of 232 with probability 0.4999999, that would be even more annoying. So the simplification editing stuff, the authors suggest that, you know, and we, we probably don't take these things terribly literally, that it's likely that we would say, eh, I'm just going to see this as 0.5, because you know what, it's close enough to 0.5. Similarly, we could say, yeah, I logically know that this is $200 and one cent, but I also know that if I saw a penny on the floor, I wouldn't necessarily bother picking it up. So to make our lives easier, maybe I'll think about this just as like 200. And it's not clear, and it might, you know, depend on the individual, how people would round things when they would choose to round things. You know, it might be different for every person. If I was to have something with probability, you know, 0.49, would I round that to 5? You know, there's some, again, some judgment call there, but at least as a general concept, it seems like there's some of this happening in the decision-making process. And notice... You know, given that we talked about last time, if a probability is small enough, we tend to round it to zero. Technically speaking, if we're putting different things into this editing stage framework, that's where this would happen. Okay. And then the last one is just talking about detection of dominance. So. This is just saying, let's get rid of things that are obviously not optimal. And there, there are technically a number of ways in which something could be obviously not optimal. An easy one to think about is, for example, if you have 
one situation where you're getting $100 with probability 0.6 and $50 with probability 0.4. And then you have another prospect where you're getting $60 with probability 0.6 and $20 with probability 0.4. <coughs> We can look at this and we can say, well, the first option clearly dominates the second option. That regardless of your personal feelings about risk, we can look at these and we can compare in some useful way. This isn't the only way in which you could identify dominance, obviously, but this is one way that you could see, obviously, that the first option is always better than the second option. Okay. So this is just saying if we can identify a situation where regardless of preferences, as long as preferences aren't totally unproductive, one of these is going to be better than the other, then we could say, oh, well, let's just get rid of the dominated options and not think about them anymore. Because if we can get rid of the dominated options, we have fewer remaining things to think about. That makes things easier. Now, I presented these steps in the order that they actually happened in the paper, or that they were presented in the paper. The authors are careful to point out that they're not meaning to imply that they think that this is the specific order that people apply these operations in, that they're just saying, here's a list of things that we think people do. You know, take that as you wish. We don't know a whole lot about, because again, it's hard to get experimental evidence. It's hard to start understanding. We don't have a lot of insight into what order people are doing these things in. And that potentially matters. That, you know, it's not necessarily the case that regardless of whatever order we apply these steps and we get to the same place. And that provides another explanation for why people might be subject to framing effects because the framing could affect, you know, even the order that we apply these steps in, stuff like that. So we can think about for each, you know, for each set of prospects that we're given, maybe we're in a situation where the order in which we do these editing steps doesn't matter, but it could matter. So it depends on the scenario. And what we do see, generally speaking, again, we don't have, at least not in this paper, a wealth of experimental evidence, but at a general level, given the questions that were asked of people and observing their choices, these steps do seem roughly in line with what people actually do. 